Yes. We're going to have each of the chair um, of the committees open up your um, individual committees, please. I'd like to call the Berlin Boylston Regional and Union 60 School Committee to order. Um, we'll, uh, we'll call the we'll Boylston School Committee meeting to order. And I will call the Berlin School Committee to order. Okay. So we'd like to start uh, tonight with a presentation. Uh, we have our Music Tech is a new course that we offer here at Tejanto. Um, this is new this year. We've had a positive uh, reflection of the class. And the reason why um, we were able to offer this course is multiple donations to the Solar Foundation uh, to give us all of the materials and so forth through the grant that Jeremiah uh, actually had applied for, I believe, with their point. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to do is have you come on up, give a little bit of a background, and we'd love to see the presentation you're going Absolutely. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Glott. I'm the uh, choral director here, as well as the music technology instructor here. Last year, we wrote a grant uh, for $21,000 through the Fuller Foundation, which we were able to obtain 10 new iMacs, two MacBook Pros, uh, Logic Pro 10, which is a professional level music uh, music editing software, as well as uh, production software, as well as uh, we put in the budget for a few seats for Sibelius, which is a professional level composition software, uh, which is also compatible with Logic. So students will, will be able to compose notation in Sibelius and export the MIDI file into Logic where they can uh, sync it up to video files or other projects. Uh, I have two MP3s I quickly want to play for you, uh, both from a uh, student by the name of Eleanor. Uh, the first song was one of the first projects we did, which was a mashup, and she took this vocal track from a song called Colors by Halsey, Halsey and uh, another, the instrumental track from another song, and she was able to uh, make, keep in mind the keys and the tempos, and she had to actually uh, edit it so that it works, but what you'll hear is that she did it fantastic job that you would not even know that it's two different songs. The second uh, project from hers that she has an MP3 from uh, is a piece where they were to choose a classical piece and find the MIDI file, uh, download the MIDI file, import it into Logic or GarageBand. At this point, uh, her computer only had GarageBand. Then she was able to change the instrumentation to whichever her desire. Uh, what you're going to find is something that sounds very similar to the classic uh, record switched on Bach. Uh, with the development of the Moog synthesizer, but this is all from the computer. the uh, audio file of James Earl Jones reading The Raven, 
you can actually go in and we can turn on the flex and what you will see <coughs> is find it. This Jeff was able to go in and manipulate the actual line of the voice of James Earl Jones and what we get is once upon a midnight dreary while I pondered a weekend weary over many a quaint and curious voice and he went and added synthesizer, a drum track, um, motifs, as of someone gently rapping, rapping, and gave it form. There's some visitor I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, ah, distinctly I remember, it was in the late December, and it suffered dying and by poor disgust upon the floor. Immediately I wish tomorrow. I sought to borrow from my books a sense of sorrow, sorrow for the lost and the more, for the rare and radiant maiden in the angel's name of the Lord. The name is here, what can we do? And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each fretful curtain. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each fretful curtain. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. So as you can see, they can do a lot. Uh, and there's a lot of information they're learning. So uh, a lot of it, while I can guide them to a certain extent, the rest is up to them to explore. So all the students in the class were given the same audio file, and were told, explain how to do the same thing, but were able to do their own variety, a different variation of it. Uh, next, we have actually a project from Allison Susan. She's going to come up and kind of talk to you through her project. So one of our projects this year was to create an original piece of, I guess, whatever genre of our choosing. And I went with the um, electronic dance music genre. So one of what we learned is when making electronic music, there are about three main components. You need the lead line, the bass line, and the drums. And each line adds a different element to the song. So I'd like to walk you through how each line adds to the song. First, you need the drums, which acts as the drums. It's, um, it keeps time, and it gets the listener in, um, interested in what they're listening to. for the song. The next part is the lead, which is the part that always gets stuck in your head, no matter what song you listen to. There's always that one catchy bit that you can't get out of your head for hours after. And then you have the bass line, which adds a little bit more depth to the song. So what I have done, I've added a lot of um, other components that kind of fall under each category or under their own individual category. And I'm going to present to you the entire piece, Candy Crush.
And this piece is still a work in progress, but that's just about the baseline of any of the song. And it can be taken in any different direction, which I plan to in the remainder of the year. Sometimes what you want to do flows smoothly, but every time you get stopped, you don't know where to go from there. A piece like that took me about a week's worth of class periods. Did you have class every other day? Yes. So. It's only, uh, again, those are only a few things that we've done. The seventh and eighth graders, part of the seventh grade music tech class, have also been able to participate in the same similar projects. Uh, they also have been collaborating with the telecom class in doing uh, audio capture for video projects. Uh, we're working on a video project in which they captured the audio for uh, senior, or some interviews that the telecom class did. Uh, we also use this technology, not just in music technology, but also uh, Mr. Pierre and I use it for assessment uh, with the band and the choruses and even guitar uh, as students develop and put together their portfolios, audio portfolios. Uh, so it's been an amazing addition to the music department, as you can see, and we are very excited to see where it goes in the future. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Currently, it's uh, offered to the high school as an elective, and as well as for the summer grade. Wonderful. Thank you. How many students do you have in those classes this year? I think. Just, I think, 15 in the high school and about 16 in the middle school, uh, which is about the cap. I have, I have 16 computers, uh, desktop computers in my room, as well as two MacBooks. Uh, so we have 18 total. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Alex, thank you. from our former colleague, Luke Ruth Blandon, who wanted to let us know about an upcoming event at Grace Baptist Church in Hudson. And I want to announce it tonight, just because I think um, drug prevention and the opioid crisis in particular is kind of one of those all hands on deck sort of things between school, home, community, law enforcement. So this is a program that's taking place April 6th at 6 p.m. Um, and it is a showing of a documentary called If Only, and it's being put on by the Mark Wahlberg Youth Foundation, Millennium Health, Grace Baptist Church, and they're working with the Marlboro Substance Use Prevention Coalition and the Hudson Youth Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. So they're going to, um, the executive producer, Jim Wahlberg, is going to be there and um, announce the film. They're gonna watch the, the film and then have a panel discussion afterwards. So, um, you, again, you can find information on the website, Grace Baptist Church, and also you could go to gracehudson.eventbrite.com. You do need to register. It's free, but seating is limited. So, thank you. <clears throat> Next um, is the consent agenda, and I would just like to give everybody a little bit of a um, overview of what those items may be and why we brought them to the table. And all three committees will have to do a vote on these people. Um, the first one, obviously, is your open session minutes. Uh, the second one is policy JLCD, which is administering medicines to students. And the reason why this is coming through to be revised and changed is because of the new regulations with Narcan. And um, <coughs> our schools have been trained uh, with Narcan. Uh, all of the administration has been Diane, yours is coming up. April. April, Ace, when is yours for the training of NARCAN? The NARCAN, we already had it. You already had it. John, when is yours? We're hoping April as well. You're hoping April as well. So, um, and the idea of training them is just so they know what to do if we have to um, mm. utilize. And I will say that um, our chief, um, Joe Flanagan, actually here in Boylston, has been doing all of the trainings, and we thank him for. Um, and volunteering this time to do that for us. 
So that's why that uh, policy is being changed. The other one on the paraprofessional job description, we currently have a special ed aid description, a one-to-one -one special aid, non-ABA description, and an ABA technician description. And about three years ago, Karen and I made that shift where we no longer had separate positions, but paraprofessionals need to be able to do all of those areas to allow us to have more flexibility um, with when we have to, you know, if somebody's out sick or what have you. And so we needed to combine the job description into one position. So that's why that's there. Okay. Um, before we call for a motion, I I apologize that I missed it in the proofing, but there is one little typo on those the minutes, and it's under section six, the business items mm -hmm. for Berlin School Committee. Section A, it just needs to say Miss Yildiz motioned rather than Miss. I'm always making motions for Burley. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Does <laughs> <Well, that laughs> <worries. laughs> so anyone else have any comments or questions about any of those three items on the consent agenda? Um, you know, if I could make a request to separate out the, uh, the minutes from but the other two is I will have to abstain on the minutes because I was not there. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. So um, do I have a motion for the region to accept the January 26th open session minutes? So moved. For the second? Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And I'll abstain. And abstain. Okay. Everybody's abstaining. And then for the region, do I have a motion to accept policy JLCD and the paraprofessional job description? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. For, for the Boylston School Committee, uh, do I have a motion uh, to approve the January 26th open session minutes? So moved. Right. And all those in favor? Aye. Uh, and I'll abstain from that. Um, and would, do I have a motion for policy JLCD and the job the description as written? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. For the Berlin School Committee, do I have a motion to accept the January 26th open session minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So for the Berlin School Committee, again, do I have a motion to accept policy JLCD, administering medicines to students, and the paraprofessional job description? So moved. I second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next, um, I don't believe we have a recording. Oh, Karen, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Um, do we have any, before we do that, though, Karen, do we have any petitions and audiences related to items on the agenda? No? Okay, Karen. Hi, everyone, I'm Karen Grosha, uh, VP of the Berlin Boylston CPAC, resident of Boylston. And I came in tonight to deliver the report to the school committee of our recent goings on and some things that are coming up. <coughs> Actually, it's all things that are coming up. Um, Wednesday, March 23rd, we're going to have a presentation from the Federation for Children with Special Needs. It's entitled Achieving Dreams. Uh, the presentation is open to students age 14 to 22 and their parents and guardians. Uh, the students will learn to develop self-determination and self-advocacy skills through acceptance of their disability and by recognizing and embracing their talents, abilities, and strengths. Um, the event is open. Uh, to the public, and it's going to be held right here in the Tahanto Multipurpose Room, and it's co-hosted with the uh, West Boylston CPAC. And again, that's on Wednesday, March 23rd, 7 o'clock. Also, I just wanted to mention that uh, scholarship applications are available in the guidance office here, also at ASABET, also on the CPAC website. We're awarding one $500 scholarship this year, and the deadline to apply is May 13th. And finally, I wanted to mention that we're accepting names for uh, Excellent Educator Certificates. 
from um, starting March 16th through April 15th. Uh, we're going to send out some flyers and some more announcements about that. And um, any teachers or staff that receive uh, recognition from parents will get certificates uh, and presentations during Teacher Appreciation Week, which is May 2 through 6. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next is my report. So a couple of things really quickly. Um, first, I wanted to let you know about the October enrollment. Um, we have actually a few, if you looked at pre-K to grade 12, um, we have um, five more students than we had previously. Um, but if you look at the elementary schools, that's where you'll see the differences. Uh, Berlin Memorial, you actually have uh, ten, um, sorry, seven more students than you had last year. However, you have two more school choice students than you had last year. Um, Boylston Elementary School have 20 less students than they had last year. Uh, you have six more school choice students, um, but you also have um, 12 less students, um, plus also you have no preschool this year in there. So that's that made the difference on the numbers. Um, in the Tejanto Regional School District, um, you have um, yeah, you have 11 more students this year than you have last year. Uh, and this, again, is in, in comparison of the October 1st numbers. So it's not from the end of the year to the beginning of the year. And as we know, that fluctuates all the way throughout the year. Um, so last year, you had a total of 13 students in out of district. And this year, you have 11 as of October 1st. OK, so pretty, pretty steady. Um, the only, like I said, the only difference is that you're really going to start to see and notice is, is more or less at your elementary levels. More so in Boylston than in Berlin. But so this one should be no surprise from what we've been talking about and what we've been anticipating. Um, but, and then the next uh, item I wanted to talk to you about is our, um, um, our QCC partnership. And um, it's something that we, it was, it was Carol, uh, Diane, and I, along with uh, Francine Gleason from the math department and uh, Lisa Saclara from the science department. We met with a representative from QCC and we have an opportunity, potential opportunity, they're still exploring it, they're still looking at the grants and so forth. Uh, but they came to see if we were interested, we were very interested in this opportunity to be able to do dual enrollment for our high school students. So students will be able to um, take a course here that is equivalent to a QCC entry course, and they will get college credit at the same time that they are also getting high school credit. So some students will be able to leave to Honto with already some course credits um, that are transferable, um, potentially transferable, I should say. You have to have a 3.0 or better um, at the college level. We also, by doing that, it also allows our teachers an opportunity that we're very excited about because it, it enriches their resume, if you will, if they've considered adjunct professors with Quinn and Community College. The requirement is they have to have a minimum of a master's degree in order to uh, be an adjunct. Um, and there's other opportunities too. There's opportunities of them going online and taking courses online. There is a fee if you're going to do this to the college. Um, and the fees are extremely minimal. What did they say? It started at 150, 150. and it went to yep. like 500 or mm -hmm. something like that. Would be learned for a full three credit course. So it really would be helpful. Um, and then one thing that um, Carol and I uh, spoke with Dr. Lewis from um, Worcester State this morning talk about even other types of partnerships at Worcester State and um, he also concurred that the courses that they take at QCC would be transferable into Worcester State and most state schools um, would accept them. Um, and he also talked to us about a different partnership opportunity we were very excited about. We got a little giggly over it. We were like, oh, this is great. I didn't think of this. Um, but they will allow us to take pre-K, K, one and two students can go to on a field trip to Worcester State and actually be exposed to science labs and they do age appropriate science experiments for the children and then they also have a little library activity at the college where they can work in the college so we are looking at um, different 
grants um, as well because of the transportation to bring them. We'd like to put that into the grant. And also we'd like to put into a grant a potential reduction of maybe some tuition if students are able to take the courses through QCC that may be through the grant opportunity for a short time or whatever. We could maybe eliminate even the minimal core cost that's already um, and we do. So it's a very exciting opportunity. It's very beginning. We haven't finalized anything yet. Um, as a matter of fact, Dr. Lewis was meeting with them tomorrow, uh, with his committee tomorrow, to talk about um, you know, our, our initiative to wanting to do something like this. And he said, I really don't see an issue with this happening. But he'll, give, he'll come back to us with more um, ideas. And Dr. Lewis was the one from Worcester, Worcester State, State University. And he's actually the dean of, education, of the education department there. So, very exciting potential partnerships with the college, and you know, I know as a as a parent of a high school student to hear that my child could take courses and that he could transfer over to wherever he or she may go, and it saves you a significant amount of tuition costs. That's pretty exciting. I think they said they have one student in another school that I think is six credits shy. So she said six or nine credits shy of a. Um, of an associate's degree. So after this semester, when they go to graduate from high school, they take like three more courses and they'll have an associate's degree. It's pretty amazing, but it's offered for juniors and seniors. So we're, we're excited about that. Um, the other piece is our service learning trip for students. I just wanted to explain, uh, just express how excited everybody was when we came back from the Dominican. Um, and what they were able to do. They planted over 300 trees. Um, we cleaned trash in the community. And we also, um, they had gardens that need to be restructured. And we took out you know, some of their gardens, replanted things. Hopefully what we planted will grow, because we were all novice, um, <laughs> being watched by the experts in the Dominican. But we had a great time. Uh, we were able to partner with um, Blackstone Valley Tech. They had 10 students and two chaperones as well. So all together, there were 33 three of us that went. And I know the students um, met after the fact to say, what do you think? This was Tahanto's very first service learning trip. Do you think we should do this again or do something different? And they were all 100%. They actually sat in on that in that meeting. And all of them were like, yes, do, do this again. It was just such a great learning experience. So we are looking at different opportunities. Um, different things, not necessarily even in another country, maybe even in our own country that we can do some service learning. What they really got out of it, I have to say, it's so important, is the difference between service learning and community service. Because they were actually learning the culture, they were living in the culture. We had uh, water that came from the river with a water hose pipe, which was this, it was like your, your regular garden hose. That's what was draining out of the river for our water sources. Um, and they were they were in the mountains and they were doing the work. It was just really great to see them um, getting involved with it. So that was wonderful. Um, China partnerships update. I gave it out to all the, the teachers as well. Um, and uh, I believe school committee are part of that um, school messenger. Correct. I think you get that as parents. You might have gotten it. Um, some parents might have gotten it if they work uh, in our district, but. Um, basically, we have a couple of opportunities. All of our Chinese agreements have been signed. They're all finalized, so that's great. Um, we finally got them back from Shanghai. Um, all, I don't know, what were they, eight copies maybe? I don't know. Um, but they are all signed and approved. We have an opportunity for teachers to be able to go this summer um, and to provide a, a week's training to other teachers. So I put that out into the teachers. I did get two teachers already that have expressed interest in wanting to potentially do this. So I'm meeting with both of them uh, to talk about opportunities. They now can uh, do a partnership with, within our schools. And I have an, um, at least one teacher already that has reached out to me saying that they want to touch base with their sister school so they can work on a project together. Um, so that's great. And then we also have the opportunity this summer to have students from China to come here for two weeks. We tried to do that last year, but their government had changed and they weren't allowing the students with a visa to come here to the United States for education last summer. So if, as long as the government doesn't change in the meantime, we should be okay. Um, Nan actually 
went over the uh, potential schedule with Diane and I. We had a couple of quick little questions, but I think those yeah. have all been uh, resolved. So she sent it now out to China to see. We did say we need 30 students uh, if we're going to make something like this work. So if that does actually come into fruition, we also will be asking our Tahanto students if they would like to come in during those weeks so that we can have more of a, uh, an immersion type program and offer uh, for our kids to come in and they can meet with the, the students from China. That's really important to them and it's important for us to, uh, to do that. So that's when we are with our updates on all of that. Exciting stuff. Good stuff. So, Julie. Uh, in your packet, I included um, updated reports for where we stand for FY16. Anyone have any questions? Julie, I, I just wanted to just reiterate um, to them where you, where's your comfort level with our current balances on each of these budgets. We're still positive, we're still good. Yeah, I mean, if we still have money left in all of our budgets. Um, probably about where we should be at this time of year. Do you foresee anything in, in the facilities or anything that would cause problem at this point? Um, Boylston, we are very tight on the facility side, so we are keeping a very close watch on that. But um, other than that, we have saved money, money on electricity and some of that, which is kind of helping offset some of that. But we hope for no emergencies at Boylston. We can always cause it to be tighter than we expected, or is it still within line with expectations? I think we just spent it maybe sooner than we did. Okay. And Scott has been trying to be proactive yeah. and try to fix things before we have emergencies, and Smart. that costs money. So, we had a couple of pumps in the boiler room. I've been in the boiler room. We had a couple of pumps. There's, there's five different um, pumps uh, that go down, and he's had to replace two of them. And so, those are like $2,000 a piece. That was a little heating, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. the heating issue that we had. There is one pump that is that we're hoping to keep us through the remainder of the year. Obviously, get the others to kick in if we need to, but that one pump is, um, I mean, it's definitely on its way out. When you look at it, you really like staying on there right now because they're, they're old. You know, they're, they're, what, they're almost 20 years old, right? Yeah. So, you, are you laughing at me? Oh, I'm just saying she's not exaggerating. <laughs> you, you look at it and it's a wonder that it's on and it's operating. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully it carries us through the rest of the heating season. That's what we're, that's what we're really hoping that, that, that we'll do. But it is something that we will need to start having a conversation with the town um, in preparation now for those boilers because you know they're getting close to being 20 years old and Boilers last about 20 years, and there's commercial, and one of them is a little clunky, let's say, right? That's a good word. The left, a little clunky <laughs> um, right now. So it's something maybe because they're expensive. Berlin just had to put in a, a boiler two years ago, it was $150,000 for what, and you need a backup. Um, so, you know, there's, and I'm not saying not what the cost is, but just so you know what they've had to go through. Uh, we were fortunate with Berlin to go through the Sapphire Grant and um, you know get some um, you know we've done it through the green um, communities uh, and so they are actually putting in a pellet boiler um, that saves it's still two hundred thousand dollars but the town only had to pay fifty thousand because the state has paid has agreed to pay for the rest I'm not sure if the town of Berlin Boylston would qualify because you have to show efforts of green. I mean, you have Tahanto here that's been helping, but your other municipal buildings aren't necessarily gone green. Where in Berlin, they've spent years of efforts of transferring everything over to the green communities. So I'm not sure if Sapphire Grant would be appropriate for Boston like it was for Berlin. Yeah, what you mean, Berlin has green community status? Just a special status that you apply for and, and receive? Yeah. Right, right. So it's something, again, I think we need to start having conversations with the select board and the think town and so forth in, um, in Boylston about how can we work together in preparing for this is going to be coming down the pike. So it's not such a shock. Um, 
Thanks, Ruth. Uh, next, we have Karen. In your packet, I wanted to give you a few updates on just things I've mentioned before. So a couple of technology things. Uh, we did change over to the IEP, the new IEP system on February 1st, and so far, so good. So let's hope it stays that way. Um, I just want to point out, again, I, I usually talk a little bit about the ELL numbers at the end of this year. So I did some graphs so that you could uh, kind of get a sense of where we're going. Uh, Tahanto has been pretty much, it's remained under four. It's been a little, uh, seven, I'm sorry, but it's been a little up and down, but um, kids come and go, but uh, the numbers stayed at seven or less. Boylston has gone up a little bit, but still kind of staying fairly steady. Um, we had one year where uh, a lot of kids kind of um, flucked out, we call it, which means that they didn't need services anymore. They just needed to be checked on and monitored, so it came a little low. But Berlin, we've seen a steady increase in our ELL population. And it's one of those things that I just want to keep in, in the back of your mind. Although eight students in each school doesn't sound like a lot, they're in all different grades. They're at all different languages and all different levels of language acquisition. So it's very difficult to group them together, and some of them have up to two hours a day of services. So it's quite a bit. So I think for next year, we're really starting to get maxed out on that ELL time by splitting it between the two buildings. So we're going to have to keep a watch on what's happening, especially in the um, We are getting more of our teachers SEI trained. I gave you those numbers, too. Uh, BMS only has very few left that aren't trained. Some of them chose to do it on their own. Um, and then we still have some work at BES and Tahanto. So, but we've got a good number of, student, of teachers trained to work with these students. Ken, what does it mean to monitor a student at ELL? What so that after they no longer need active services in ELL, for two years we have to go and get reports from their teachers and check in on them and make sure that they're doing okay. If after two years there's been no issues, um, we release them completely. Sometimes during that two years we have to pull students back in for a little extra work if they're struggling in a particular area. Anyone else have a question? Did you have a question? Yeah, I Thanks. Do you want me to ask one? <laughs> <laughs> you just look like you had a question. Now that I'm looking at these graphs, I do have a question. <laughs> no, I'm really, I'm trying to decipher what, I can see that they're split up by year. Mm -hmm. Are they the three schools, the graphs themselves? At the very top, it's got the name of the school on the graph, BMS, BES. Can you see that? I don't think it came two, Oh, it's yeah. two lines. Yeah. All right, so I can tell you the first one's BMS, the second one's BES, and the one that's by itself is Tahanta. The printing is very light on. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Sure. Carol, would you like to go? Sure. I know I had mentioned at one of the last school committee meetings um, that we did, but I didn't mention it to the whole group, that we did receive a Biogen grant for $5,000 toward the creation of maker spaces in both of the elementary schools. So I just wanted to make that public for everybody. So we're excited about that and the elementary schools. And we do have um, the two PTOs who are actively working as well on bringing more technology and engineering kits and opportunities to the children. So they've really embraced that time to, and that effort to get that off the ground. So we're excited about that. Um, we also just submitted a grant for um, Teen Dating Violence Prevention and Intervention Program at Tahanto. Thanks to the uh, work of the Crisis Committee, Diane and Karen were involved in that, Janet Zaquera. So we are hoping to be proactive in bringing uh, more ed education to our students around those particular topics. So we're looking forward to, to getting that grant. I did want to mention on the, the STEM Advisory Board, I just can't say enough about that group of parents and uh, teachers, administrators, interested community members who came forward and are really excited to bring STEM and soon to be STEAM opportunities to, to the students in all the schools. And uh, one group right now, subcommittee is working on a, a spring event mm -hmm. um, in May called May the Fourth Be With You. Mm -hmm. And that is an elementary uh, school event and that's going to be a Star Wars theme. They're, they're planning a way. I, I, we have a Google Doc going and all kinds of Things are happening uh, that evening for students in grades K through five. 
We're working on a career day uh, for the eighth graders in the end of May, and that will be a part of presenters in the morning, and then in the afternoon there will be a panel discussion. So we're working on getting folks for that. Survey goes out uh, Thursday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, to all of the eighth grade students regarding um, their career choices uh, for speakers. And the, and the other piece, there's a, a, a smaller group of individuals in the STEM advisor, advisory, including Paul Merrill, who took on the, the task of, they told me not to call it a database, so it's community connection, is that what they ended up calling it? It's actually a resource database that they're getting into the system so that, for example, a teacher, if they have a particular topic they need help with, biomedical engineering, they want someone to come and speak to the students about that or work with them in the classroom, they'll be able to type in and pull up community members' names, volunteers from the area who, would, who have given their time to be able to come in and do that kind of work. And they'll specify what they can provide for that particular classroom, so. Yeah, and two of them actually went and was in, in mm -hmm. Wales yesterday, mm -hmm. and they were meeting with the teachers to talk about what would, the te what would work for the teachers, what would that you know software device look like, and what would they need, and talk about drop downs and so forth. So they're, they're really going in and, and talking with the teachers to see how they can make this community, what? How they can make it really work well with the teachers. So I thought that was great. I mean, taking all this time to really get to the interest of to make it beneficial. Yeah, it's great. It's all their volunteer time to do this. So yeah. very appreciative. Thank you, Carol. Paul, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so again, you have my report. Um, I do want to just call to um, the attention um, or maybe some thank yous for the folks doing the access for ELL. So along with those those ELL students that you get a lot of data on from Karen, um, for the, this was the first year they did electronic testing and it was kind of um, a, here you go, yes, we've done this in the past through paper, but oh, by the way, uh, now no longer we're going to do paper, only kindergartners are going to do um, paper materials, it's all going to be electronic. So um, not a lot of early support from the state, although it, it went fairly well. In the United so I wanted to thank um, the principals who did a great job, um, Karen for organizing and, and keeping a fantastic schedule for the kids, and Leanna Parsons and Liz Gustafson for um, doing a fantastic job given the fact that there wasn't a lot of early support from the, the state to, to have that happen. And one other thing I did not include in my written report, I did want to say that um, over vacation, um, some work was begun on some of the security things, some of the more intrusive things that we wouldn't want to have done when there were kids in the building. So it's, uh, progress is being made towards the security um, upgrades at the two elementary schools. That's it. Any other questions? Thank you, Paul. Um, John. Hi. Very quickly. Good evening. Um, you've read my report as well. I'll just very quickly mention a couple of things. Tomorrow we're celebrating Dr. Seuss's birthday, Berlin Memorial, and looking forward to a community reading day there. Um, and then the other thing I, I've been trying to keep you updated on our PBIS adventures. We currently have a survey out in uh, the school uh, for staff, kind of assessing where we are, where we'd like to go. We're hoping to have that survey wrapped up by the end of the week, and probably next month I'll be able to give you a little information about how that survey turned out. Any questions for John? Okay. Ace? Yeah. Um, again, you, you have my report as well. Uh, the one thing that I'd like to, to make sure that I, I announce here publicly um, you know, it's with mixed feelings. Mrs. Lori Benson, one of our fourth grade teachers, uh, has announced her retirement. She's been an integral part of the school and the community for a long time. She's been in the building for over 20 years as a classroom teacher, as an assistant, and as, as a parent. So in all those capacities, she's touched countless, countless student lives. And you know, for that, I think we're, we're all very grateful for her contributions to, to Boston Elementary School. And we wish her nothing but the best as she gets to spend some time with her grandkids. So. Thank you, Ace. Um, Diane? 
Um, you have my report as well. It's a wonderful time of the year for assessment coming up. Um, we begin, um, as all of you are aware, for 10th grade, it is still a requirement that our um, sophomores continue to take the MCAS test um, via paper and pencil, so that will begin um, in March, followed by park testing for um, grades six through eight, MCAS in mathematics for grades 10. We have AP exams, senior exams running up in May, and um, we end the school year with MCAS biology in the high school and math with grades for grades six through eight. So we're gonna just juggle all that, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> You're well. Um, so, and then we're gonna be welcoming, um, beginning our transition of the fifth grade up into sixth grade. We, um, as we have done in previous years, will begin with um, something new this year, March 8th and 9th. We have um, our current sixth grade teachers are gonna go down and shadow um, some fifth graders um, to see what life is like, like for our fifth graders so they can have a better understanding of you know, what the students are experiencing, where they come from, to hopefully um, help with transition of the fifth grade um, into the sixth grade. Myself and Greg Picarello will also be going down to the elementary schools to um, do a welcome and an overview and an introduction to our middle school program of studies. And then we'll round the year off with a, um, a parent meeting here for all incoming sixth grade parents to go over our scheduling process. We will also be, we had an administrative meeting on Friday, um, we will also be doing a survey for our, with our current sixth graders, either next week or the following week, asking them, you know, how did we do in the transition from fifth grade to sixth grade? Were the things that we could have helped students in preparation, you know, when they were a little bit earlier, when they were in fifth grade to help them transition to sixth grade. How did we do when they came here as sixth grade with the transition? So we are going to be surveying our current sixth graders during um, the time in which the middle school counselor will be going into their core academic classes. So that will begin as well. Thanks, Diane. Um, and, and the idea of doing that actually came from the eighth grade. This year's eighth graders, people don't realize they're not, were, were our first sixth graders. So it's nice to talk to them to hear what their transition uh, was like and bring it back to the, to the administrative team to meet with all the new graders each year. Uh, this is what uh, John, Ace, and Diane came up with uh, to try to do something with the sixth graders now and see if they're sharing the same things that the current eighth graders are thinking. Because um, you made a lot of changes. So yeah. This is the third third year of having sixth graders and each year we tweak it a little bit more and a little bit more so yeah. that's, that's great next couple yeah. weeks that's that's sounds like a great idea yeah it's nice. great thank you all right so we have um berlin boylston and the berlin boylston yeah. union 64 committees we'll be looking at the uh, business items a and b the first policy social networking is a first read this has been, uh, has gone through um, numerous discussions with people, uh, including technology departments, each of the, uh, the teachers unions actually had a chance to review this as well. And um, uh, Tom, Larry, and I uh, spent some time uh, going over the languages and, and some of the changes as well. So this is just a first read for you to look at um, and to you know, provide any feedback or anything between now and the next committee. Does Tom or Larry want to elaborate on this one at all or is there anything else? Um, just that the uh, the West the West sub committee had gone through uh, and recommended a number of changes. Uh, so with that the draft is mostly what you see there. And then what Tom and I had with the opportunity to to to, to you know add more comments, but we haven't met since then, mm -hmm. and so we haven't gone over Tom's comments yet. So you know, as a 
and you'll see, visual yeah, features. and you'll see my comments or my markup there. And on 4A, I get what it's saying, right? And I, but at the same time, what I'm trying to really say there is that we only have certain people that are authorized to speak, and I don't want this to supersede any other rules, right, that we have. So I don't know the right language, right, but that's kind of what I was, my comment there was to say we need something really to identify that. I actually and like both your edits mm -hmm. over the yeah, other sure. version. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think we definitely need, it's a good policy. I think it, We've strengthened it through you know, our, our first kind of cut at this. Definitely input's needed. Um, this is a, uh, not challenging, but it's definitely one that is always changing, right? We need to definitely be on top of it. I think your suggested edit is helpful around speaking for the school district because I think the way it was worded, it almost, I mean, it, it acknowledges that people will perceive it, but it almost gives tacit approval. Good and one, yeah. so I think but that's what I'm trying to get to. Right? Yeah, I, I think you did that with your suggestions. So if you review them and you have other suggestions or whatever, please send them my way and, and I will share them with on the way. Is this replacing a policy or is this new? So there was a um, what was it called? I don't know what it was called. Um, it was a different. Yeah. Um, it was very specific. It was just called like online communications or something. It was very vague and didn't. This is much more descriptive than what we had. You know, as times have changed and we're using social media and so forth, we have to get more clear. Um, it was yeah. much more related to email and yeah. it was very, it was, you know, almost 10 years old and so. Yeah. Didn't really <laughs> be into a ball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next is the 2016-2017 um, school year. And this has been um, going around. We talked about it last time. I brought it back to the teachers' uh, unions. I know that uh, each of the principals brought it to the. Um, PTOs as well for feedback. There was a lot of mixed conversation um, between, you know, going a week earlier or staying with the initial proposed day. That was the biggest one that we had talked about. Um, and I, I actually would propose that we um, stick with the original date of the August 29th and the first day of school for students to be August 31st based on all the different feedback that I got from everybody. And when we went back, I think it was, oh, I think it was 2010, 2011, I think was the year when it started very similar to this was the date that we started. It was August 29th, and the school date would be August 31st. Um, so that would be, you know, like I said, we, we heard both back and forth, but I think we've all kind of concurred that the best date was to start um, on those days. Sorry, which day was that? I'm sorry. So we would start where August 29th is the first day for Berlin and for Tahando teachers. August 30th would be the staff opening day, and August 31st would be the first day for students. Okay. And then for Boylston, the staff opening day is August 30th, and um, the students' first day would be August 31st. So the first day for all three schools is August 31st. Um, Berlin has a new contract that they have two days before, and Tahanto has it where they only have one day before. However, they have really appreciated the last couple of years to want to do two days before, so they have one less during the school year, so they can start off stronger. But Boylston teachers just want to stay with the one day before and have the other one have their additional days. So, so you're recommending uh, the uh, the uh, the the draft number one for each school in our in our, yes. in our packets mm -hmm. yes draft number one for each what, school. is it b dash draft number one is it <laughs> <laughs> one a one a draft, draft number one, one a okay um, 
<laughs> maybe in the concept that had been discussed was you're ending in June on a Tuesday, half a day, and the starting school on the 31st versus just even backing it up a couple of days at least would have it ending on school would end on a Friday. That did, was not a fairness. Yeah, and actually, when you got the original one, Laurie, the early release was on that Monday, because we had miscalculated the day. So it actually ends up being on a Tuesday, so it wouldn't have. And you know you're not going to end on a Monday or a Tuesday anyway, I'm just saying. <laughs> not on that week anyway. <laughs> I, I like this first day for students on August 31st, just because it simply is consistent with what we've, we've been doing for the last 10 years, starting on the last... Tuesday or Wednesday for students, most recently Wednesday. I know we still have a lot of families that would love to wait till after Labor Day. And when so this year it gives kids an extra long summer. It gives kids a 10-week summer because we've had a pretty pleasant winter. But when you look at next year's August of 2017, I mean the last Wednesday is the 30th. The, the year after that it's the 29th, so it kind of keeps working back so that after this nice long summer, next summer it's regular nine full mm -hmm. weeks. Provided, you know, again, provided maybe next this year coming up, we only have three snow days. You know, again, more than that, it cuts into your full nine weeks. But it, I, I just really appreciate the mm -hmm. consistency and also looking forward into the next few years as well. But we're, and we're also ending a day later because of the change from the half day right before Thanksgiving. Okay. Right? So that added a day at the end. Right. The attendance was very, I think I brought that forward to you last time, the attendance was very poor for our student population on that Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, it just wouldn't make sense to have it. And that's why you wanted it this last year. And we were going to try it and see, but it just didn't work. Could we look at the attendance this year too with a full day? Because it might not make any difference. You know, I mean on the Tuesday? Because we, we're doing it with no school at all. Okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we have no school. And the dean does have those numbers. I asked her to roll those numbers for um, this year and then last year, looking at just the Tuesday without the Wednesday, just to see. And it, it is very striking. How many students were absent this Wednesday? So and she has that for some other strategic days throughout the year as well. The day right before Christmas break, so you can. So I, I do think you should yeah. share that. Yeah, Cheryl has it if you want to look at it because Cheryl and I put it together um, the last time that we had it. We just didn't get brought up. So I just hate going so late into June. I really do. I feel like we. You know, the productivity of those days is very limited. It, it's, so my preference is if it's possible to minimize how far into June we go, that would be helpful. But obviously, we're trying to balance a lot of different things, and a lot of different people's opinions. Right, and as it is this year's December break coming up is the shortest we've ever had. Because it's just the Monday to Friday, and you have, you know, have more. Yeah, I mean, right, you, well, you come in, well, Monday, January 2nd is your holiday that you celebrate on the 1st, right? So you come back on Tuesday the 3rd. It's very short. So. Yeah, we have to get the days set. And, I mean, uh, it's... You can either give up days and other vacation period, but at the end of the day, it's they got to get to them. Mm -hmm. um, it's there's going to be someone either side of the aisle or going to want to, you know, go back early, to get out early, and it's, it's just it's never going to balance. And I, 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 in my position is I, I like the proposal. I'm very impressed. I'm very. So they'll need. We we'll usually do the region first. All right, so no other comments or questions? Okay, so I'll call, do I have a motion to approve draft number 1A for the Tejanto School Committee? So moved. Second? Second. 
Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have a motion to to uh, approve calendar draft one A for the Royal Sun School Committee? So moved. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. For Berlin, do I have a motion for the school calendar 2016-2017 draft one A? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, I think though, there might be a question. Do you have a question, Karen? Quick question. Is it for 180 days of learning or 183? No, students is 182 student days and 187 staff days for Berlin and, and Tonto. 186 staff days for um, Boylston. And is is the state regulation 180? The state minimum is 180. Minimum. Mm. minimum. Yeah, it's right. Minimum. It's so a I minimum think. hours and a minimum number of days. Any of the days that change have been negotiated into the teachers' contracts as well. Because, so, yeah. I mean, that would alleviate some of June's days also. I work in Northboro, we have 180. Right. And um, it gets hot in the summer, it gets yeah. hot in June. When you don't have air conditioning and it gets hot in August, it was yeah. very hard. To I know it's so hard in New England. Some years it, it, it's hotter in August and it's in yes. June. Like last year yes. wasn't too bad. This so August was hot. This August yeah. was hot in September. Right. So yeah, I know. Yeah. So if you just never know in New England which way it's going to go. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Nidhi? Yeah. Um, Karen. Lori asking about uh, going too far into June. I, I know I have friends in a district in Maryland that have a vacation that's centered around Easter for March and April yeah. combined, and they don't do the February, April vacation right. race that we do. So I thank you for bringing that up. Do you mind if I address this? Okay. Um, so actually, there are some districts that have tried that here in, in Massachusetts, um, and I believe Rhode Island is, is trying it right now to some of those districts as well to have one one week. We've gone back and forth since I've been here, it's my fourth year, um, we've gone back and forth with those discussions. We've talked to the, um, the teachers unions as well about, you know, they're, they're instructing every day. Um, and what we've seen is that with all the illnesses and so forth, that April's a good time to break. And then Fe April is also, you know, so February and April are good breaks in between, especially with all the illnesses and so forth that happens. And it also gives the, te uh, the teachers and the students a time to just kind of reboot and set themselves anew. And sometimes to go from January, January can sometimes be long months, to go from January to March without any time in between. Um, some students really have a difficult time with that. So we did get feedback, we've been talking about it. It's not something I'm totally for or totally against, um, but it's, you know, I, I still bring the topics up whenever we can, because we're trying to, but we did see, and last year specifically, even in, in Berlin, boy, did they need that February break. Um, you know, it was really, there was a lot of illness there. It was just good timing to have that February in between. So I know it's in offer this year, because of facility move requirements, they actually shortened their February break. Mm -hmm. They did two or three days instead of a full week. Is that even something we would maybe consider in the future? Just it's to something to bring forward to, to, the, to the teachers as well. You may be able to say four days if you just cut them short a little bit, mm -hmm. give a break, but not as long. Yeah, I think um, in some of the districts, I know last year, given all the snow days that they had, they ended up shortening like their April break yeah. um, because just because they needed to fit in their dates because they were going all the way to the You can't go after June 30th. It's a whole different contractual mm -hmm. year. Okay. So, yeah. All right, so next we have the Berlin Boston um, appointment of the personnel subcommittee. Yes. All right. So we need to appoint a personnel subcommittee, and I would like to appoint. Lori and Cliff, are you in agreement with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so for the Berlin School Committee, we can have Julie talk about the net, the net meter credit agreement. What that sure. Means. Okay. So 
Um, this is something the town of Berlin has already agreed to, so they now have offered it to us. Previously, we've bought our electricity, electricity from the same sources they have, so um, probably makes sense to keep doing it. Basically, see if I can explain it. The net metering, there's a solar um, farm one up in Clinton. And basically, the DOER, the DOR like, works out these deals where you kind of buy credits and then you can save money. Basically, it should save us about $10,000 a year. So right now, we're spending about $48,000 in electricity. So they're proposing to save about $10,000 by um, these insurance agreement to buy these credits. Things, and I'm going about a couple of things we need to have them address in the contract, just a couple of items. Yeah. Okay. Questions or? Well, I guess it's about the contract. Have we had legal review? Yeah, it's 31 pages. I got it yesterday. I, yeah, I didn't get a chance to read it. <laughs> they haven't looked at this yet. I think Berlin is Berlin's legal looked at their version, which they are the same contract. But we said is it the ours. same exact? Yeah, it just has just the schools. Yeah, but I can have our own. Um, I can have look at it. Can we actually work. submit it. Yeah. 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 I mean. Sure. I think that's a really good recommendation. Um, I felt totally incompetent in <laughs> knowing what we were signing up for. Okay. So could we just at least entertain a motion to approve um, this recommendation, um, provided it's been approved by your legal counsel? I gotta repeat that, don't I? Just yes, you do. Somebody can just say, yeah. somebody you want me to make the motion? Do you want to make that motion? <laughs> you want me to make the motion? Sure. Let me stop. I think I had it in my head now. It just flew out the window. Uh, I make a motion that um, we, uh, let me see, we approve the net metering credit program for Berlin Memorial School pending review by legal counsel and their recommendation. I second that. All those in favor? I, I, Aye. 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 Sorry, I just have a question. I do. Um, so, so they already have a solar farm location that they're using, and that's the one in Clinton. They're building it right they're now. They're building it right now. So as soon as they're built, then it starts. Basically, I think they have to find the municipality and take the credits before they like start building it. Right, that's kind of what I thought we had to have people on board. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like they're waiting on us because they need to know if we're signing up and we're not taking them, then they have to get someone else to take them. So, oh, gosh. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. So that's great. And then the year, um, 20 year contract basically starts when the solar farm is complete. Julie, I have a question actually on this one. Put it on the spot, sorry. Um, but I'm just thinking, in at Tahanto, is there any no? It's boiled like boiled light, isn't it? Um, it's right. because it was National Grid in Berlin That's right. that yeah. this can happen because it's boils and light. I asked you that already, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, there's a yeah there's you a knew that there. already, didn't you? <laughs> as soon as they said boil them up, yeah, I already asked this question. Sorry. All right, so next we have the capital request for Boylston School Committee, and I'll have Julie explain uh, these requests that we'd like to bring forward to the um, finish line. Okay, so we've kind of gone over and come up with four items that we feel are most important for Boylston Elementary School. Um, the first one is um, window and vent ceiling on the exterior of the building, about $29,000. Uh, phase two of the security system. Uh, we started this year with money that we got previously from a capital request, but we still need another 31500 to complete the whole security project. Um, the gym soundboards, we've already had to take a couple down. Um, they're in really rough shape. They need to be replaced. Um, this is our second quote. It's a little better than the last one, but it's $40,990. And the last one is $15,000 for door repairs and adjustments. As the same thing we talked about at Berlin, as the doors age, the mechanics of the door, some need to be replaced and adjusted, and they're at that point where not all the doors are functioning. So 
And, and I think, you know, the only thing I want to add with Julie is Scott has done his due diligence of getting quotes for these, so these aren't just out there kind of numbers. And we got the original one from the soundboard. He went back and, and got another company and tried to get another quote. So he's been doing his due diligence to have as true and accurate of a number uh, as possible before we bring this forward to the FinCom. Um, and actually, uh, you told me. Butler, that some capital improvement requests would be coming forward, but we had to vote for the school committee first. I haven't actually shown them the numbers. We haven't shown the numbers so. because we wanted to read it to you first, but I just told them that we'd be bringing forward some capital improvement requests. Um, on, the, on the door uh, repairs, or re repairs like that, where we're not actually purchasing capital. We're actually we're repairing something we already have. Isn't that an OPEX expense and a CAPEX? You know, we're just following the same procedures that we're doing in Maryland. Some of this needs, this needs to be done in order to finalize our security systems. Um, and some of the some of the locks will actually have to be replaced and readjusted. Combination. Okay. The, the only thing to suggest is that you know you put this back into your budget because we need to fix some, but. I, I I understand the, the quandary. It was just more a question of where we're calling it out as re repairs, and that typically wouldn't be capital. Should we be switching the word repair? I don't know. If if it's okay with the the with income, and I, w I would. I would probably be making it clear that some of those re re repairs are needed in order to prepare them for the security system. That might be how we have to package it. Can you remind me how these kinds of capital items are funded through the town? So in other words, we submit these outside of our regular budget. Right. right. There's, there's separate warrant articles for capital improvements. So the town would vote, yes, we want to repair the window ceilings or replace them. It's actually replacing all the ceilings on the windows. <coughs> um, OK. So I recall us doing um, computer upgrades <coughs> last year or two years ago. So will each of these appear on the warrant as an individual item? That so it will depend on how, on. I think it depends how Boylston does it, right? Do they do, they, I don't know how show it as individual items. Normally it would be as separate items. Um, and if, the, if, if there was some reason that they chose to do it in some other way, I guess it's possible, but typically it, they'll call out um, you know, like, you know, each item is a, because they are completely different things, mm -hmm. how, how they actually capitalize and pay for those costs, that, that I don't know. And they may come back and say so there's an alternate way that they feel it's they can possible. get with the outside of what we're asking, what we're saying. You know, or they can come back. Utilize so, the buildings we have and move them forward, these are the costs we need to assess to the town. So you're looking for a motion to approve these capital requests to be forwarded to the town. Okay. So second. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Um, that's it. I don't know if there's any school committee comments or future agenda items.
meetings will be the budget hearing. And if we have other topics, we will do it at the end of the budget hearing. The beginning is the budget hearing. What I particularly like to do is um, send out the full budget school messenger to all the parents and the community um, prior to the budget hearing. So if they have questions, they can bring it forward. And then we'll do a final uh, vote at the following the school committee feels appropriate to vote at that committee meeting, at the budget hearing. Sounds good. Yeah, I do have one topic for the future, unless it's been sure. handled a different way. Last time we met, we saw the presentation on the trust. Oh, yeah. Um, was the follow-up that we talked about there, and probably time for a good one. Yeah. So Julie's been starting to get uh, information from other companies, so I'll have her do it. There is some working on another proposal to send us. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and we'll do that at the Great. That's all I got. That's it? All right. So, so do I have a motion to adjourn to the region? Nothing without trust. Second? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 I've never told you. Do I have a wait, motion to adjourn for Boston? So moved. <laughs> All of them. Do I have a motion to adjourn the Parliament School Committee? Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> 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 <laughs>